delighted to introduce Sean Gallagher. Um, he's a philosopher and a cognitive scientist, and undoubtedly, I'd say most of the people already know about him in this room. Sean is currently the Millennium and Maury Moss Professor of Excellence, and he's got, he has a secondary appointment at the University of Wollongong in Australia, and he's also an honorary professor of health science at the University of Tromsø in Norway. Um, so there's a few things there, and that's just, you know, basic stuff. Um, he's also held, held secondary, um, or held visiting positions at Cambridge University, University of Copenhagen, École Normale Supérieure Lyon, and um, the Humboldt University in Berlin. And most recently he was a senior research fellow at Keble College in Oxford. Um, he's also been awarded numerous grants. The current ones are the Annalise Meyer Research Award, awarded by the Humboldt Foundation. And he's also part of an interesting project uh, funded by the Australian Research Council on minds and skill performance. Um, I think Sean, for me, exemplifies the best qualities of the modern day philosopher. Thoroughly engaged in his metier, but also tireless in ensuring that his work actually speaks to people outside his discipline, outside of philosophy. Um, and so, I think, you know, very similar to Nolo Ponti, who was very keen to engage in all sorts of areas, um, Sean is doing very much the same. So, you know, if you look at his publications, you'll see he's written on not just phenomenology and you know, the scholarly work, but also um, cognitive science, uh, using the cell, um, solitary confinement, and even awe and wondering astronauts, you know, who were experiences in outer space. So tonight, Sean will speak on the topic, Inside the Gaze. Okay, thank you, Anya. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, okay, so I want to start uh, with a, uh, an unusual study uh, by uh, a group of scientists uh, in, in Switzerland, Zahn, uh, Aleska, and Hubert, uh, who document a case of uh, what they refer to as anonymous vision. And uh, they have just one subject, uh, referred to as DP, uh, who is a 23-year-old male who came to them initially complaining of double vision um, after having uh, flown halfway around the world and did, uh, he, he did some deep sea diving. And, uh, so one could expect maybe that caused some complications in his, uh, in his system. Um, an examination revealed that he did not literally have double vision. That is to say, he did not see objects in double. Uh, rather, what he actually came to describe was a two-step process involved in seeing. And here is uh, Zahn's uh, uh, and, and colleague's summary. When looking at or concentrating on a new visual object, he is able to see the object as a single object, but the way he perceived had markedly changed in, in a, a way which he had never experienced before. It appeared to him that he was able to see everything normally, but that he did not immediately recognize that he was the one who perceives, and that he needed a second step in order uh, to become aware that he himself was the one who perceived the object seems to be two steps in his perception of objects. It's a curious case that actually challenges a philosophical principle, we call it, a principle uh, that's referred to as uh, immunity to error through misidentification, IEM, uh, uh, which is just the idea that I cannot make a mistake about who is experiencing some X when it is I who am experiencing it. And this idea comes from Wittgenstein and was developed by Sidney Shoemaker um, uh, back in the 50s and 60s. And uh, Wittgenstein would say something like, it's a, it's a kind of an absurd question uh, to, to ask. Someone is seeing the object, is it I? Well, Zahn uh, uh, and colleagues um, engaged in that philosophical um, issue, and they suggested uh, that this case shows an exception to IEM, uh, 
and a selective loss of the sense of self-ownership, specifically for visual experience. They did a lot of tests on DP, uh, and he showed no signs of schizophrenia, no psychiatric conditions uh, showed up. There were uh, uh, no problems with attention or uh, any kind of deficits with respect to executive function. No problems with action. Uh, he had an, intent, uh, an intact sense of agency. He had normal proprioception, a sense of bodily ownership. All of these things were, were fine uh, for him. Imaging studies showed abnormal hypometabolic uh, functioning in the inferior temporal, parietal, occipital, and precentral regions. So there were some uh, indications that something was not quite right, but it wasn't very clear uh, at all uh, uh, what was going on. And Zahn uh, et al. <coughs> rightly note that a single case can never reveal whether abnormalities in a brain region are sufficient or even necessary to evoke <coughs> abnormal experiences. So I think it's clear that we can only draw very limited conclusions from this one case. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, the researchers were really unable to follow up or to get more details about EP's phenomenology. They explained he came in uh, uh, to their clinic and they did a lot of testing over a few days. He left and then kind of never came back and not quite clear um, that they could get in touch with him after that. So I actually wrote to Don to, to find out some more details and he didn't have it. But there's one further item of interest uh, in the report of BP's problem. Um, it was confined to the perception of objects. And his perception of other people and their movements were perfectly normal, uh, as were his social interactions and communications. Literally, however, this is about all we know. Um, here is uh, Zahn uh, uh, saying, he underwent no apparent changes in his perception of other people's movements. Social interaction and communication were normal, which was also confirmed with the patient's uh, parents uh, with whom he was currently living. So they had a little bit of information, but not a lot, and they didn't really do any testing on this particular aspect. Uh, but there, there was no report that he was having any trouble recognizing others, for example. So focusing on this particular issue, um, which indicates, I think, a, a difference between object perception and social perception, um, both in DP and I think more generally. And uh, granted the scarcity of empirical data in this case, um, I don't want to sort of cite this case as evidence or anything, um, but I, I'll just wanna, I just want to take it as a philosophical starting point. So, I think uh, we know that visual perception of objects is not just a passive sensory process. It activates, for example, the dorsal stream uh, processes that anticipate potential action towards an object, which we just heard about. Uh, it activates, perhaps, canonical neurons if it's a tool or something that we can pick up and use. Um, and as uh, Alvin Noe and uh, other uh, inactivists uh, point out, um, Perception is an active, uh, it's based on sensory motor contingencies. Uh, so it's a very active type of process. On the other hand, we, we can definitely say that objects do not return one's gaze. They don't respond in the same way as other people, uh, and sometimes non-human animals. More generally, the other's gaze does something to me it elicits certain responses from me, even if their gaze is not directed towards me. So, for example, subjects who follow another person's gaze, looking towards or away from, will evaluate that object as more or less valuable than those that do not receive attention uh, from others, those objects that don't receive this attention. And combined with uh, emotional expressions on the other's face, uh, you get an even stronger effect like this. So these are based on empirical studies. Um, there's also a kind of action priming, uh, activation of dorsal premotor cortex, and 
anterior or frontal gyrus, so a lot of motor areas, let's say. Uh, when not only we see someone reaching for an object, uh, but simply if we see them gaze at the object. So I can do something to you right now just by looking at my bottle of water, apparently. <laughs> gaze uh, following leads to shared attention. Um, the other person's gaze guides attention even at eight months. Uh, for example, infants follow the direction of the gaze behind a barrier, indicating an understanding that the agent sees something that the infant does not. Okay, that's, that's sort of about gaze, uh, where we're not actually looking at each other. Um, but when I see the other person gazing at me, eye-to-eye -eye contact, let's say, something much more complex <coughs> happens. I want to consider um, here what I will suggest are two abstract views. I might get some pushback on this. Uh, one is the view of Jean-Paul Sartre, which has been mentioned uh, already. And uh, another is the view of Levinas. I'm not going to give you a detailed analysis uh, of these uh, philosophical views here, but I'll simply try to say why I find these accounts abstract. Sartre's analysis, and especially his examples, uh, are one-sided, <coughs> I think. They focus on what the other's gaze does to me from the outside, even without me seeing or meeting the other's gaze. Sartre was influenced by his reading of Hegel's oppositional uh, concept of recognition, which tends to reduce social perception to a kind of alienated uh, experience of being an object to the other. And it limit self-consciousness to a kind of an exclusion of every other. And those are, uh, here is Sartre summarizing Hegel. He says, thus the primary fact is the plurality of consciousnesses, and this plurality is realized double reciprocal relation of exclusion. <clears throat> it is by the very fact of being me that I exclude the other. And the other is the one who excludes me by being himself, the one whom I exclude by being myself. This is a, a Sartre a summarizing, basically, Hegel's uh, view. And I think this, uh, this kind of comes out in Sartre's own examples. And the famous one is uh, the Peeping Tom example. Uh, Dermot, I think, mentioned it in passing this morning. Uh, so it's a, it's a, I think it's a very well-known, uh, so I'm not sure I have to explain it, but uh, there is a, a peeping Tom who is caught in the act looking through a keyhole uh, in the door, for example. And he's caught in the act only in the sense that he hears the floor creak behind him. So he doesn't see anybody, but he, he feels the presence of another person gazing at him. The unseen gaze of the other, then, according to Sartre's analysis, turns him into an object. Now he is the peeping Tom. So through the gaze of the other, I am set up within a world that is made alien to me. And here again is Sartre describing this. For the other's gaze embraces my being and correlatively the walls, the door, the keyhole, all these instrumental things in the midst of which I am now turn toward the other, a face which, on principle, escapes me. So on his reading, social relations, at least in everyday inauthentic or bad faith relations, are defined in oppositional, alien, uh, alienating terms, where subjects are viewed as objects. Again, uh, Sartre says, the shock of the encounter with other, for me, a revelation in emptiness of the existence of my body outside as an in itself, being in itself for the other. Thus, my body is not given merely as that which is purely and simply lived, the lived body. It becomes extended outside in a dimension of flight which escapes me. Now, that's not the whole story uh, for 
the SART. But it seems to me that it operates as a kind of presupposition uh, for, at the start of his story uh, where there is no face-to-face -face encounter. Um, and uh, in being a nothingness, for example, we do find a lot of footnotes and provisos uh, about this is a, an analysis of bad faith, and he promises uh, later uh, an analysis of good faith, and we might see something very different there. But at least this is uh, the kind of central to the analysis that we find in, in being a nothingness. Now, in contrast, for Levinas, what I see is the other's face, which is irreducible to its objective properties, its physiognomy, its shape, color, or morphological features. Rather, what I see is the significance that transcends any of these properties. The other transcends categorization and resists being simply a physical object. At the same time, the other resists being simply an epistemological subject. She is not equivalent to being an invisible mind, for example, or a set of mental states that we might be able to reach through uh, processes of inference or simulation. So if for Sartre the gaze is judgmental, for Levinas, it is imperative, and it makes an ethical demand for us. In contrast to Hegel and Sartre, the face-to-face -face is not oppositional. Complete oppositional arrangements are disrupted by the transcendence of the other, the fact that we can't reduce the other just to an object. The abstraction, what I, I would consider the abstraction in Levinas's account, is that despite the specificity <coughs> of the subject, the gaze is without context. It transcends context. Its demand is indeterminate, something he says is beyond understanding. So the ethical operates as a kind of unconditional imperative for uh, Levinas. As Adrian Peppers points out. Again, there's much more in both Sartre and Levinas relevant to these considerations uh, that I'm not going to be able to explicate here. There are, in fact, I think, pointers to the point that I now want to make. Um, so I'm sure if uh, there are Sartre and Levinas scholars in the audience, uh, you, you will think uh, I've been unfair in some way. Um, um, but uh, I'm, I'm just being practical. It gets me to the point I want to make. Uh, the gaze is always, the point I want to make is this. The gaze is always attached to a face and to a body and to a situation. Uh, so that when I see the other gazing at me, when I meet the other's gaze, lots of things happen both to me and to the other. So I want to describe this under the title of elementary responsiveness. The perception of uh, the other gazing at me, uh, or more generally, face perception, presents not just objective patterns that we might recognize as emotions. I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, experiments that are set up in just this way, where we see a series of, of faces and we're asked to name that emotion. What is the emotion on that face? Right? And that's just about recognizing an emotion. But that's not what we do in our everyday life. Rather, in our everyday encounters with others, that involves complex interactive behavior and response patterns arising out of an active engagement with the other's gaze. Not a simple recognition of facial features or a simple recognition of emotions, but an interactive affective, affective response on our part. So to flesh out the notion of gaze here, let's start with the infant, who responds differently to things that are agents or persons uh, and those that are non-agents or objects that they see in their environment. They respond in a distinctive way to human faces, 
That is, in a way that uh, they don't respond to uh, other objects. Again, uh, empirical work uh, in developmental psychology shows us this. Infants focus on their caregiver's eyes very early, and uh, although an infant may start to follow the other's gaze, usually the caregiver is looking at the infant, so they don't follow them out into the world. That might involve later, a little bit later on, uh, joint attention to objects in the world, right? But uh, very, very, uh, very much uh, involved with what's called primary intersubjectivity. They have a very close dyadic relationship of face to face, looking at each other. Infants, uh, at this point, share emotions. They exchange smiles. When, when playing also with a toy, uh, and, and there is joint attention uh, with the other, you, uh, they also are uh, interacting uh, and trying to catch the gaze of the other, as, as they do. Um, and, of course, they get visibly upset if the other person they're interacting with assumes a passive face, uh, and there's been a lot of experiments on that. The gaze, uh, in such instances, is neither a passive observation nor a disorganized glance. It appears, at the very least, as an active, interested questioning. And we experience it as something to which we need to respond. If you've held a baby recently, you, know, you, you, you respond to that, that infant. So this is what I want to refer to as uh, elementary responsiveness. Um, and I, uh, uh, I have a paper where I, I develop this concept in contrast to Axel Hanna's uh, view of recognition. He also thinks it's very basic. But I think there's something slightly uh, different about uh, what I'm talking about here. So what is experience in cases where I meet the other person's gaze? It's not a matter of me seeing the other's face simpliciter, but of seeing that the other sees me, or quite literally, me seeing the other seeing me. The other's gaze is precisely not something that can be subsumed into a uh, strictly visual representation of eye direction, since it has uh, an affective impact uh, on my own system that sets me up for further response. My perception is not just the activation of retinal and cortical neuronal processes that lead me to believe something about the other person, or to think that they have a particular belief or desire in their mind, um, in a kind of folk psychological way. So for example, activation of early perceptual processing areas in the brain reflects more than simple feature detection. Already, neurons in B1 anticipate reward if they have been relevantly attuned by prior experience. So prior experience of rewarding situations causes plastic changes in, in uh, the visual cortex, and uh, they are already there with vision. It's not vision first, and then something about reward, but it's uh, vision already uh, in the mode of expecting reward. And uh, not just face recognition areas, when, when we see another person's face, it's not just face recognition areas and ventral visual recognition pathways that are activated, but also the dorsal visual pathway, which uh, seems to suggest that the other presents me with social affordances. I see them in terms of how I might interact with them, or what we might be able to do together. So visual perception is already informed uh, with affective value from the very start. There's a very nice study by uh, Barrett and Barr, uh, uh, which uh, shows that, again, just uh, immediately upon uh, visual opening of the eyes, let's say, even before recognition in terms of the timing of the brain, uh, there are responses, they describe, responses signaling an object's salience. The relevance or the value, these things don't occur as a separate step after the object is identified, right? 
They, uh, instead, affective responses support vision from the very moment that visual stim uh, stimulation begins. So the, the affect is front-loaded into the vision. Simultaneous, then, with the very earliest part of visual perception, the perceiving organism initiates a host of muscular and hormonal changes, sensory motor patterns that include involvement of organs, muscles, and joints uh, associated with prior experience, integrated now with current extraoceptive sensory information, uh, which then helps to, to, to guide our response and uh, our subsequent actions. I'm summarizing here the, the bar. My perception of the other's gaze um, seems to involve a kind of global bodily activation. It activates bodily processes in response to what I see. Changes also in the perceiver's breathing, muscle tension, or stomach motility have an effect on perceptual experience, even if they are recessive to what the perceiver him or herself experiences. So you might say it, it kind of sets up a somatic context associated with previous experiences. As a result, we see others through the affective responses that they generate in us. So if my entire system is activated in its own motoric, hedonic, and affective ways, involving basic processes like heart rate, respiration, hormonal flow, and so on, all of which have an effect on my perception, <coughs> Such effects um, actually turn out to be much greater if there is a, a potential for interaction. If I'm not just observing someone, but if I'm in, the, in a kind of interactive situation. Uh, and specifically, if one is gazing into the eyes of a, a, a real person who is gazing back, in this situation, in this situation, it includes a synchronization of specific brain areas across the brains of both subjects. But it also includes a, a more full-bodied, affectively rich, what Merleau-Ponty would call a intercorporate. Um, so to sort of pull this together in, in the end, um, the fact that the other returns the gaze and that this strongly registers uh, in our perception, as, as Sartre makes very clear, provides part of the basis for regarding the other not as a mere object, or as Levinas makes clear, even as a subject understood in a, kind of an epistemological or Cartesian way, uh, someone who is merely a bearer of mental states. Rather, I see meaning and emotion in the other's gaze their face, and their bodily comportment, you know, more generally. T, rather than Levinas or Sartre, suggests the right angle on these issues uh, in his appeal uh, to uh, Valerie, and he, he quotes Valerie here. As soon as gazes meet, we are no longer wholly two, and it is hard to remain alone. This exchange, and the term is exact, realizes in a very short time, if we go you know, to milliseconds on a neural, uh, neural scale, uh, in a very short time, um, a transposition or metathesis, a chiasma of uh, two destinies, two points of view, thereby a sort of simultaneous reciprocal limitation occurs. You capture my image, my appearance, I capture yours. You are not me, since you see me and I do not see myself. What I lack is this me that you see. And what you lack is the you that I see. And no matter how far we advance in our mutual understanding, as much as we reflect, so much will we be different. 
Going back to the original case I started with, seeing without an eye, uh, in the case of DP. Of course, it's only momentary that he experiences this. This is a very short time frame that we're talking about. He sees an object and then some kind of process of maybe a reflective process gets him to it to, to the point of recognizing that he is the one seeing the object. So it's only momentary uh, for his perception of objects. So perhaps in that case it's a, maybe a process of elimination where there are no other candidates, uh, no one else that he can access their perceptual experience, so it must be him. Uh, so maybe it's a, a very quick inference that he makes. In the case of seeing the other person, this happens without delay. DP sees, you might say, with an eye, which is what Valerie had called the me that you see, an eye that he experiences because he sees, uh, because the other rather sees him and is the you also at the same time that I see. That's common. The question, uh, I think, and maybe motivated by the case of DP, is something like this. Is the eye that sees the other different from the eye that sees only objects? I'm trying to point here uh, just really to a kind of intersubjective dimension that's kind of built into the self, uh, the eye in this case. I think Merleau-Ponty could easily accept a revision to his own statement, a statement which uh, Levinas might resist. Uh, Miller-Ponty says, to see a face is to have a certain hold on it. Um, but I think we could rather say, for me to see a face is for it to have a hold on me. And Levinas uh, might say that at the end of the gaze, there is no end. The gaze veers off towards infinity, in his terms. And Sartre might say that in an authentic relation, at the end of the gaze, there is nothing that is pure subjectivity or a kind of human transcendence in his terms. Uh, on concepts that acknowledge more embodied and worldly contexts, um, we might say that there is something imminent in or at the end of the gaze, something that elicits an elementary uh, responsiveness that remains closer to our intercorporeal encounters, an eminence that is not nothing, but also not everything. about the difference, I mean, I think you talked about it a bit towards the end, but in, in like the kind of case where I'm, you know, I'm aware that you're looking at me, um, and then say I convert, like covertly start looking at you, right, and maybe there are kind of repeated iterations of this, so it gets kind of complicated, um, I'm looking at you, you're looking at me, blah, blah, blah. Um, right, there's, there's that, and that kind of generates an effective response in you, Exciting, maybe scary. Yeah. Um, What's he looking at? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, like, probably um, well, the responses, I mean, like, there are new performances. Um, right, but then there's the case where, where our eyes meet. Um, right, in the previous case, we both know that we're looking at each other, but like, we aren't like warming up to it or something. And then when we look at each other, it's kind of out in the open. Right, so there's a kind of mutual awareness which isn't in the like kind of complex iteration type here. Um, and I just wanted to, to, to ask whether you saw that as like a, a difference in kind, is what, or, or is it can that just be understood on the same model as like the iteration? Yeah, I'm tempted to to say it could be understood in the same model because I, uh, I think even in those cases of uh, where we're not admitting, so to speak, or not overtly gazing at each other. We, we might have an idea that we are. 
But there's all kinds of variation. I might be looking at you covertly and thinking that you're looking at me covertly, but you're not. Mm -hmm. So I'm uh, something different there. Um, and then there's uh, the guy behind the counter in Starbucks, right? Where <coughs> we we don't gaze into that guy's eyes too much, right? It's just it's not. And yet there's something there's there's some kind of minimal anyway uh, kind of acknowledgement that this is a human being and so forth. But we tend to forget that, right? So we don't pay too much attention to that. So I think there's a whole range of uh, these kinds of uh, scenarios which uh, I have not tried to you know, map out uh, on this theory. Uh, I think it's a really good question about what, you know, to what extent uh, might we have changes uh, in kind rather than degrees. But I, I would try to go with degrees right now. Um, but I don't know if I could defend that uh, right now at this point. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, 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 are you happy to think that perhaps, like, if we just keep adding the iterations, and then at some point we'll be able to model the what I want, what I'm kind of trying to consider is like this kind of neutral open. You think, yeah, you'd be happy with that. I'd be happy for that with that right now. Yeah. But I don't know if I can really justify. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so. You mentioned a number of analogists. You didn't mention Kusas name. Oh, I'm sorry. To say <laughs> <laughs> I just want to ask you, if, uh, could he's making one distinction that you didn't mention? I just wanted to know whether you would find that distinction uh, interesting. So he also runs through some of his manuscripts. All these different examples with me looking covert to somebody else and vice versa. And then he also discusses the case where both of us are kind of looking into each other's eyes, but then he contrasts that with what he calls uh, communicative engagement, and I think that there's an important difference between those two cases. So even in a case of reciprocity <coughs> or mutual responsiveness, basically looking at each other, he says this is not yet enough for a real ideal relation. If we have an ideal relation, we have to be communicative engagement where I'm trying to affect you, I address you, and you respond. Yeah. And, and he wants to say that in that latter case, and there's really something else happening, which might be uh, very important for a lot of other issues that you didn't explicitly mention. But I just want to mm -hmm. ask you whether you don't think, I guess this is a leading question, whether you think there's something important happening at the moment to try to influence each other rather than just staring passively at each other. Yeah. And this might be a place to go looking for the answer to your, your uh, question. Uh, yeah, so I mean, one thing I, I would want to insist on is that, of course, this just doesn't happen in midair without context, right? Uh, I find myself looking or gazing into your eyes only within a kind of context that's already there. I would think that uh, um, our interactions may, may very well be already ongoing, uh, and the context defines what exactly and there are differences between looking into the eyes of someone who's threatening me as opposed to looking into a friend's eyes or something like that. Uh, so I think the context really would answer those. I mean, you get different answers to, to that question depending upon what kind of context you're, you're trying to describe. Uh, but I, um, I don't know if I actually touched on uh, the distinction you want me to, to respond to. It's still this issue of trying to address the author, having an uptake and the author responding. I mean, there, there, some, there seems to be something more going on there than just having this issue where I'm looking at you and you are looking at me, yeah, yeah. recognizing that you are looking at me. I mean, it's like that in itself doesn't yet change enough. But the moment I start kind of put you to you and you respond, something in you yeah. develops. I'm just, uh, I guess I'm just trying to say this, you know, this mutual uh, eye gazing uh, is, is uh, not that abstract. It's already kind of in, involved in that kind of thing. Matthew? Yes, I do. Yes, uh, the, the main part of 
take her. I'm wholly sympathetic to her, and I agree that there is this difference between uh, interpersonal perception and experience and just gazing upon an object. But I'm finding it hard to make sense of this DP story at the beginning, and I'm not quite sure how you would interpret it or whether you would accept this very strong claim that you can have in a perception that appears initially not as one's own, and then oneself sort of clicks in a little bit later. And one, one possibility is we could adopt a sort of deflationary interpretation and see it in terms of something slightly more mundane, so that you have an initial fleeting defamiliarization, uh, perhaps because a scene doesn't involve practical solicitation. And that could be described in terms of it doesn't feel fully there or I don't feel as if I'm fully there, except in this case, then bang, you're in the room immediately afterwards. But whatever it involves, I find it difficult to see how it works as well. It sounds plausible if we think of perception in a very episodic way and we focus on being presented with an object. But what happens when you enter a room that's full of objects in which you're practically engaged as the whole room appears not mine and then it suddenly appears as mine, but then you have a context that appears as yours, but then you've got objects in that context that don't appear as yours and then they suddenly do. And then maybe you turn around as it stopped being yours again. So dynamically, I can't really make sense of the experience at all. And I wonder whether you can say a bit more about your own take on that. Yeah, well, um, so DP comes complaining about an experience. So um, his, his explanation is not very clear, at least at first, uh, to the researchers. And they try to make it more precise. I'm not sure that they went into those uh, precise details about being in a room with objects. And that's about attention, perhaps where your, your attention goes. Um, and it's like, so I'm, you know, that's why I'm, I'm not saying this is, uh, this is, I'm not saying this is evidence for anything. This is a kind of starting point. I, I'm puzzled as well. Right. Um, and uh, I think the researchers are still puzzled. <laughs> but, there, but that there was something uh, up in, in the brain and that he was reporting some anomalous experience here. Uh, that seems right. Yeah. But the, the details are just very, very fuzzy. But the, to, to me, the interesting detail, which is still very, very fuzzy, is that, well, the same problem didn't occur for him when it was another person. oversimplified a lot with Sartre and Levinas. And uh, for, uh, for example, Sartre was, will, will start to describe uh, the experience of the people who come, right, as uh, feeling shame, yeah. suddenly. Yeah, so there's already a feeling. So I, um, I think that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, to say uh, there's a lot going on that we can uh, sort of describe in bodily terms, affective terms, and that can fill in a lot of what 
both Sartre and, and Levinas are trying to say. So uh, if we ask, you know, what, what does transcendence mean for Levinas? If I look into the other person's face and somehow or other I see something that's just beyond anything I can grasp. Um, you know, still, all these processes must be going on, I would think. Uh, and that must be informing whatever that means. So trying to figure out what that means, I think it's difficult without getting the full story. John. Um, you mentioned uh, showing them a little bit. And I think there are these extreme cases where you show it. So a shame that you cannot look someone else in the eye. I just wanted to, wanted to pick up with that because that's a, sort of an understanding of what it would be like to continue with the gaze, but you're not subjectively, you're not or affectively, subjectively capable of it anymore. So yeah. It's kind of almost a limit case. When you don't want to when you, when you when you feel guilty. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Um, so that, that's that's part of a, a response that. Mm -hmm. uh, that already presupposes, in a certain way, what, what the gaze of the other is doing. Is Dorothea here? Oh, so you, the other night, you were telling us about being in Japan, and uh, and feeling. I don't want to put words into your mouth, but kind of feeling alienated because uh, uh, you know they would not make eye contact. Uh, like Japanese. Yeah, and, and just, just the fact that there are cultural differences uh, is, I think, an important thing because um, uh, it, it's we might we uh, in, in the West we might think uh, addressing the other person uh, is really about catching their gaze or, or meeting their eyes or something like that. And in other cultures, addressing a, a, another person is just quite different. Uh, and if you do, you know, try to catch their eyes, it might be taken in. We've got time for just two more questions. I've got Anna and Dominic. So first, Anna. Thank you. Um, my, my main question was if you had actually looked into the case where things go wrong. And I'm, I'm interested in that, in, in that, um, well, in those types of cases, because it might speak to something that you mentioned in passing, and I just want to clarify that that's possibly you. So if things go wrong, I think it's, um, at least from logically, it won't be a particular disorienting. And you mentioned in passing Italy or the minimal uh, representation of it. And going back to uh, Dan's distinction between, on the one hand, you know, recognizing somebody as a human being, I mean, that's fairly minimal. If you like, seeing them as a you who can address you requires far more particularity. And you might think that that is what is more in the much more ethical sense of a moral achievement. Yeah. And I mean, maybe that is something that can also explain at least the logic of the things go wrong. Terrible I mean, I think uh, things go wrong a lot. Uh, <laughs> you, uh, in your in one's relations with others, uh, there are a lot of misunderstandings, uh, and uh, those gazes sometimes are <laughs> real questions or or comments <laughs> on what uh, what people are thinking. Um, I think there's a lot to study. Uh, you know, um, there's a nice uh, point to the work of Charles Goodwin. Uh, he's done really fantastic uh, work describing interactions. Uh, and there's a, one great uh, example he has of an interaction between two young girls who are playing hopscotch. I think I mentioned this to some other people. Um, hopscotch is the game, you know, you jump two squares. But something goes wrong. Uh, what goes wrong is that uh, the one girl 
starts to think the other girl is cheating. And then you get this really, really rich um, description of what exactly is going on with gestures, bodily postures, bodily movements, uh, positions vis-a-vis -vis one another, uh, how close the gesture is to the other person's face, and of course eye contact and all of that. It's hugely complex the way uh, it's described. And uh, I wouldn't want to say, oh, there's something just very specific we could say about what goes wrong when, with respect to gazes, meals. There's all this other stuff going on too. It's very hard to, to control for any of that stuff. Right, last question. My question was addressed already. Oh, okay. All right. Well, um, we've got one minute. Can you deal with another question? Sure. Okay. Um, yes. No, yes, that's you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, after quoting that book from the living room, you um, did make a like in passing uh, do some conclusions that um, so there is a little bit that you can do with yourself. I was wondering if you can quickly elaborate on that. Um, yeah. So, what do you do yourself doing there and like how strong you can be? Well, I mean, there's a lot of work done uh, in phenomenology. Dan Zahaki has done a lot of work on this stuff. Um, and. Uh, the idea uh, that there's a kind of primacy to the social. Um, there's it's a lot of different people from a lot of different perspectives uh, will say the same kind of thing. So what I am uh, is already something um, that is uh, it's the result of, it, of inter prior interactions <laughs> and so forth. So the I that, uh, you know, what I was trying to sort of hint at is the I that uh, allows DP to see the other is, is not same necessarily. I'm not quite sure how to put that, but uh, it's, it's not. It, it's something like already uh, influenced by the intersubjective, and that's what allows the gaze to do its work. So it's, that's not very clear. Sorry. Okay. Thanks, Sean. So um, we're, it's not going to be such an easy or to trip over to the embassy. But